Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Caribbean Economic Outlook for 2019. We'll discuss what's going to happen and what to expect for the rest of this year um, for all of the countries in the Caribbean, as well as a bit about what's happening in the global economy. Um, and to help us with that, we have my special guest today, David McWilliams, who will talk to us in a little while about what's happening in his part of the world uh, on Brexit and the implications for Brexit and, um, and what's likely to happen. So the outline for the presentation today is basically going to be a global overview and the risks to the global um, economic uh, performance. We're going to go over some tourism performance uh, data for the Caribbean. We're going to talk about the growth outlook for the region as well as each country individually and then we'll conclude. So on a global scale, growth has really uh, been revised downwards by the IMF in the last few times that they put out their growth uh, projections. Uh, advanced economies was revised down to 2.36% for 2018, and that's projected to fall to 2.1. So growth is slowing down in the advanced economies. Latin America and the Caribbean forecast was a revised down from 2% in April to 1.6% growth in July, and then again revised downwards to 1.2% uh, growth uh, as of October of last year, according to the World Economic Outlook data set from the IMF. Now, I just want to bring David in now to share with us what his thoughts are on Brexit and how that's going to turn out and what the implications are likely to be for not just for the UK and for Europe, but even for the rest of the world. Welcome, David. Marla, how are you? Lovely to hear you. Lovely to hear you. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. Good to have you. Thanks for joining us. Not at all. My pleasure. So tell us, what do you think is going to happen with Brexit? Well, obviously, the, the, the British have made a sort of a monumental mistake, which has uh, displayed all sorts of flaws in our thinking about Britain that we never really thought about before. One, that the country couldn't govern itself. Two, that the economy was much more dependent on the rest of Europe than they led on. And three, that the actual gel that gels Britain together was considerably less adhesive than we thought. So next week is a big, big moment, Marla, in the whole Brexit calendar. If you're over here on this side of the world, it has become like a pantomime. You know, it's like theater and you've got the sort of the, the sort of the middle of the road Tories and then you've got the extreme Tories and then you've got the middle of the road Labour Party and then you've got the extreme Labour Party. And what is basically happening is up until this week, the extreme, what I would call the Brexit jihadis on the right wing who want no deal and they want to crash out and they want this sort of neo-Elizabethan Britain to re-emerge as a trading nation. There's about a hundred of these MPs, maybe less, uh, maybe 75 odd, uh, and they are running the show for the Conservative Party. Very extreme, uh, tend to have a historical view of the United Kingdom based on the time when the United Kingdom ran places like Trinidad and Jamaica and Ireland and Barbados and all that sort of stuff. And then on the extreme left, and they're very anti-European, and on the extreme left, you have the sort of the Marxist rump around uh, Corbyn that were always very anti-European because they thought it was too right-wing. So what you have is you have the right-wing who think the EU is too left-wing, and you have the left-wing who think the EU is too right-wing, and the big chunk in the middle, which is most parliamentarians in Britain, haven't had a say until the last couple of days. It now appears that Mrs May, who keeps going back and forth to Brussels to get a deal, doesn't seem to realise the European Union don't need a deal as much as Britain needs a deal. Uh, she has got her deal, the, call, the, the May deal, on the table, I think, next Tuesday or Wednesday. And the likelihood is the Parliament will vote against that, the House of Commons will vote against that. But if the vote is not a total catastrophic vote, uh, May will be regarded as being wounded, but not totally wounded. And then she'll go back to the European Union and look for another concession. The likely concession they'll get is on what's called the backstop, which is the relationship between... Europe and Britain via the border in my own country, Ireland, between Northern Ireland and uh, the Republic of Ireland, where, where I am in Dublin. And chances are we will probably give them something 
to be able to go back to their people and to suggest that they haven't been totally humiliated in actual fact it's a piece with honor and my own sense is my own sense marla is that the hard brexit is becoming less and less plausible and more and more remote and what is more likely is a sort of a softer focus brexit uh, whereby the european union continues to be involved and britain britain is in a customs union with the european union and ultimately that buys Britain a little bit more time in order to have a negotiation on what the final trading relationship is going to be. But the most interesting thing is that this has displayed neurosis in the extreme in the United Kingdom and a sort of an element of self-pity amongst uh, the British negotiators that people don't understand them, people don't realise how brilliant they are and ultimately that uh, to do a deal with Britain is an amazing thing for the European Union. Well, the European Union is saying, well, look, if we have a deal with you, you want a divorce. It's like any divorce, right? It's kind of hissy fit. It's a bit like somebody said, you know, I want to divorce my wife, uh, but I wouldn't mind sleeping with her again in the future at some stage, if she doesn't mind. And I wouldn't mind sleeping with her in her house rather than my house. So when I get sick of the new chick that I have on board, I'm going to go back to the old chick. And then you think, why is the old chick not really dealing with this? Why is she saying that doesn't suit me? So there is an element of a uh, ridiculously, how would I describe it, um, over-optimistic divorce proceeding that the Brits are, are, are involved in. But the dust will settle, Marla. The dust will right. settle. And mm-hmm. that's the most important thing. Now we're in the theatrical stage and it's histrionics and all that. And it's, it's good to look at, Okay. But the dust will settle, and I don't believe there's a constituency, a centre ground constituency in the United Kingdom to crash out of the European Union. And I think that eventually they will vote on something a bit like the May deal. And the May deal kind of keeps them close to Europe, but not necessarily in Europe, which is broadly what most people in the UK who voted for Brexit want. And then you've got to think, okay, what is it going to do to the UK economy? Well, right, that's what I was going to ask you about, because the thing is, the UK economy um, does have quite a bit of influence in terms of how some of the Caribbean economies perform. So that's what I was really going to ask you about next. So sure. go right ahead. <laughs> so I think that uh, with respect to the UK economy, obviously, if you decide that you don't want to trade with your main trading partner, which is the European Union, it sends a signal to investors, foreign investors in the United Kingdom. The UK is incredibly dependent on foreign investment for any sort of technologically or, 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 or manufacturing savvy that they have. It's kind of sent a signal that this is not necessarily a very serious place. So I think it's going to take a little while for the UK to recover from that. And as a result of that, I think the UK economy is probably going to suffer not as much as the more pro-Brexit media suggest, but it will suffer. But what it's going to do is going to rebalance the economy away from its traded sector, ironically, towards its non-traded sector. And its non-traded sector is a very low productivity sector. So what you'll see is wage growth will be weak, even though unemployment, our employment will be high. They will run their current account deficit as they always do. Sterling will probably weaken a wee bit. And there'll be just a general cloud over the UK for a little while. House prices in London will fall quite dramatically as they have been doing over the last while. And my sense is that the UK will be weakened. In terms of their relationship with former Commonwealth countries, Mm -hmm. uh, as you said in the Caribbean, this seems to be their shtick that basically they will give the two fingers to Germany, France, Denmark, Netherlands, Ireland, all the countries they trade with, and they'll resurrect some relationship with smaller countries that they used to occupy. And that will ultimately uh, be their salvation. I can't see that as a particularly interesting deal from the Commonwealth side, particularly as the biggest Commonwealth country, India, has no interest in doing a bespoke deal with with Britain. Yes. Has no interest. India and Canada will make all the difference for in terms of a Commonwealth deal, but um, exactly. we small, us small countries we're happy to have deal, <laughs> you know. Um, Look, you're like us. You're like Trinidad and Tobago and, and Barbados, Jamaica. You're like Ireland. You know, we don't get to set the terms of the deal. Unfortunately, we're deal yeah. takers. We're not deal makers, and that's 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 life. That's what happens when you're a small player. Indeed, except that I think, you know, the fact that the UK is looking more towards the Commonwealth than it has in, in, in my memory um, 
it, 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 it's a, I think it's a good thing for the region, for the Caribbean, um, because it means we don't just have the EU, EU to negotiate with, we have two separate uh, entities. And if the Commonwealth is willing to negotiate with us and for us, with the rest of the world, then we potentially have more bargaining power, potentially. And it looks as though from all the, you know, royal visits to, to the Caribbean, and, and that kind of thing, it looks as though that's the way they're going to try to reinvigorate the Commonwealth as an institution and also as a collective in terms of the other countries and to try to form a much stronger um, trade uh, uh, alliance than it has been. And we, in, certainly in the Caribbean, we look forward to that. No, I, and I think, I think that uh, you're probably absolutely accurate that they will now try and redouble their efforts in the Caribbean. They will try to redouble their efforts in parts of Africa, maybe mm -hmm. with the Kiwis and the Aussies as well. Uh, the big players are India and Canada, but that doesn't mean just because they don't get a great trade deal with India, it doesn't necessarily mean that there won't be positives for the Caribbean. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that there's a much more proximate uh, relationship between the Caribbean and England than there is between, for example, the Caribbean and Germany that would have dominated the trade talks in the past. Exactly. No, you're, you're exactly right. So, I mean, lots of excitement and lots to look forward to with, with respect to the uh, backstop next week. And let's see what happens. But the Caribbean, of course, is watching closely because countries like Barbados and Antigua um, and others depend very heavily on the UK economy and so the last when when the Brexit referendum first happened it was it was quite noticeable how far and when the sterling collapsed actually that was when we saw tourism just collapse um, coming from the UK and so a lot of countries are bracing for that in this region. So it'll, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, it will be interesting you know my, my own sense is that is, is, is that, you know, for the economy, the worst is probably over. They've, they've had nearly three years of this Brexit stuff. Um, and right. it's hard to see the currency getting much, much weaker from where it is. It's getting a wee bit weaker, mm -hmm. but the big kick in the currency has come in the last two years. Um, and right. the, the question then is, you know, are the English middle class who largely travel to the Caribbean on holidays, are mm -hmm. they going to stop that? I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure. I think that what you have is a great theatrical media political event. I'm not 100% <laughs> certain the economics will follow, but it's very clear the British economy will reorientate towards its non-traded sector. Mm. Um, that's what I think, uh, because mm. investment in the UK, inward investment, very much drives the uh, UK's manufacturing base and the UK's to the extent that it has a high-tech industry, it's high-tech industry. So, but again, it's lots of good theater. Let's just see how it all pans out. Indeed. Thank you so much, David. Really appreciate you joining us. Not at all, Marla. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. So, so we move on now, you know, to talk about the global um, economy beyond, beyond the UK. Um, and global growth is expected at 3.7% this year um, and next year, which is a little bit lower than what the IMF had previously forecasted. And that has a lot to do with the trade uh, tensions and the fact that interest rates are going up in the US. Um, a bit of it has to do with the fact that oil prices have been fluctuating and have been really trending more towards the downside. Um, and financial markets are also uh, showing quite a bit of vol volatility. So all of these are weighing on confidence and weighing therefore on investment and therefore on growth. Now, beyond that, uh, if you look at what's happening with the US dollar, the US dollar has been appreciating. Uh, what that means is that the US dollar is strengthening relative to the other major currencies. So the, the UK pound sterling, um, the euro, the Canadian dollar, the yen and so on. But what it means is that all of the Caribbean currencies, which most of them are pegged to the US dollar, 
And it means that all of our currencies, therefore, are moving in the same direction relative to um, those other major currencies. So as the US dollar strengthens, it takes our currencies with it. And so when that happens, everyone who has Canadian dollars, pound sterling, euros, yen, etc., the price for our exports in this region, which is priced in US dollars largely, has then become more expensive in, the, in those other currencies terms. And so price competitiveness of our major export, which is tourism, but our other exports as well, um, so price competitiveness has suffered. And incidentally, uh, according to the IMF, a 1% appreciation in the real exchange rate causes a 0.17%, it caused a 0.17% decrease in stopover arrivals from 2000 to 2015. And this is across the Caribbean. Um, but apparently the higher end destinations don't suffer as much uh, to, with this, but it, it does have some implications. Um, now, the other, the other uh, risks that I want to highlight um, from a global perspective, but for the region as well, is what's happening in Venezuela. But it is clear that the situation in Venezuela, as we've been saying for quite some time, is unsustainable and it presents a major risk for this region on a, on a few levels. One of them is that over 3 million people have fled Venezuela in the last three years, about 10% of the population. Some of them have gone to parts of the Caribbean like Guyana, like Trinidad, um, and even the Dutch islands as well. A lot of these people have been excluded from uh, uh, from um, proper health care for many years. There hasn't, hasn't been vaccination and proper medication in Venezuela for a long time. And so right now there is, for example, a malaria outbreak in Trinidad because of, um, largely because of Venezuelan um, refugees, if you will, uh, who are infected with malaria coming over and they just don't have the medicine to cope with, with the disease. Uh, and so it poses a health risk for all of the countries uh, neighboring Venezuela. And from a tourism perspective, if you remember what happened with the Zika outbreak, that tourism really suffered as a result of that and fears of people traveling, you know, of childbearing age not wanting to come to the Caribbean. Um, this this uh, malaria outbreak and other potential health threats can affect tourism in the Caribbean as a result of Venezuela's uh, instability. So that's a risk I think that we need to bear in mind in 2019. Now let's switch to talk about tourism. Um, so as we know in 2017, hurricanes Irma and Maria took a major toll on tourism and we're still seeing the effects of those storms. Um, and so there are countries like Puerto Rico, Anguilla, US Virgin Islands and so on that saw negative growth in their stayover arrivals in 2018. And that's because they're still uh, reeling from the storms. Uh, the countries that saw the highest growth last year in stayover arrivals was Guyana, Bahamas, and well, D Bahamas is a fairly distant second, um, Belize, Cayman, etc. With respect to cruise tourism, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Grenada saw some growth, whereas again, St. Martin, Anguilla, Dominica, those countries that had been affected by the storms, they saw declines in their cruise um, stopover arrival growth. Um, we expect that in 2019, um, <clears throat> some of those countries will continue to recover and rebuild, but there, there could be um, some implications still from those storms lingering in 2019. Now let's switch to talk about global growth. Um, with respect to global growth, for 2018, uh, we saw that the Dominican Republic, again, continued to be the strongest growing economy of the Caribbean and including Latin America, and followed by Grenada, a lot of Eastern Caribbean countries growing at between two to three, even up closer to 4%. Um, and then on the lower end, 
those storm, those sorry countries affected by storms. So Puerto Rico, Saint Martin, Dominica. In terms of, of, of the projections for 2019, Dominica is projected to grow at 9.4% this year, but it's important to note that this will not fully restore, even a growth of 9.4% this year, will not fully restore GDP in Dominica to its pre-hurricane level. Um, and Puerto Rico and Barbados are projected to show some contraction this year. Uh, Puerto Rico mainly because of their structural problems, but also the uh, lingering effects of the storms. Barbados because of the massive um, fiscal adjustment that's taking place and the IMF program uh, really taking uh, effect uh, this year. So we'll go through briefly uh, now the, the individual countries and their outlook and performance. So in Barbados, we saw that for the first uh, nine months of last year, there was an economic contraction of 0.5%. Um, there is a, a lot to, that's happening that can counteract uh, the negative growth, for example, uh, construction and, in, and investment, but we still have generally um, high unemployment of around 9.2%. Um, and inflation that trended higher as well. Um, the things to watch out for next year is, so sorry, for this year is basically the fact that the government is going to push through a lot of reforms. We saw the taxation reform, for example, to corporation tax being equal onshore to the offshore um, rates. Uh, that I think is one of the major things that demonstrates how serious and committed this government is to um, to reform and also to um, adhering to the, or, or I should say abiding to the international, the demands of the international institutions. Um, and the government does seem committed to the IMF programs. I think that they will continue to adhere to the, to the guidelines and, um, and we'll continue to see the economy improve. Switching now to the Cayman Islands, of course my favorite place and the best run economy in this region. Um, in addition to running uh, consistent fiscal surpluses, we have growth of about 4%. In the Cayman Islands, there's been 8.5% growth in construction. Stayover arrivals are up 11%. Um, and unemployment is actually at pre-global financial crisis levels of 3.4%. And remarkably, their debt to GDP is only 14.4%. 0.5%, 1.4.5. Let that sink in. That's like a record low rate. I don't see rates like that, uh, debt to GDP rates anywhere like that in the region. And that's down from a peak of around 24% um, in 2011. What to look out for in 2019 This in, in the Cayman Islands? Basically, you have much more investment coming with respect to hotel projects um, and the uh, 15% import duty concessionary rate on building materials has been extended to December of this year. So, which means at the end, by the end of the year, it means that that's going to promote more um, uh, construction and investment. The financial services sector accounts for 41% of GDP in the Cayman Islands. And just recently, the Cayman Islands revised their taxation legislation due to the pressures that they came under from the OECD under the base, base erosion and profit shifting um, and harmful tax practices uh, uh, um, initiatives. And so they had to revise their tax legislation and this can have some negative implications for growth, well, for that sector and for growth overall, but the country has strong fiscal performance and buffers to withstand any challenges. And I'm pretty sure that the Caymanian people will find a way to recover from any negative fallout from that, because they always do. Moving on to the Dominican Republic. Um, so again, this economy um, has been the strongest growing economy in Latin America and the Caribbean for a decade. Um, and are growing at about a pace of about 5% per annum, which is pretty fast. 86% uh, of GDP 
is related to private consumption. Um, and so growth is not really government spending driven, it is private spending driven. Um, they've had 30 billion, over 30 billion US dollars in foreign currency inflows for 2018. Uh, what to watch this year from the Dominican Republic? We expect that the peso will continue to depreciate a little bit, which could restrict consumption. Inflation is expected at around 4% for this year. Um, tax reforms are coming in the Dominican Republic this year. Um, and But we expect economic activity still to remain robust as it has for several years, as we, as we discussed. Um, but higher public debt and a fiscal deficit with narrow, a narrow revenue base um, could pose risks to the growth um, forecast. Now let's switch to Guyana. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, as we know, Guyana is on a per capita basis, one of the poorest countries in the, Carib in the Western Hemisphere and is the poorest English speaking country on a GDP per capita basis. But on a resource basis, um, uh, Guyana is probably the wealthiest country on the planet on a per capita basis. And that's simply because of all of the natural resources and, and that they have and what has been discovered in the last couple of years in terms of oil. Now, unfortunately, there's now a lot of political uncertainty following the motion of no confidence and the legal challenge to that motion that um, recently took place in Guyana last month. Um, the economy grew by 4.5% in the first half of last year of 2018, but there's still 12% unemployment, high fiscal and external deficits. Now, but based on the over $5 billion, sorry, 5 billion barrels of oil that's been discovered, GDP per capita is expected to double by 2023. So what to watch, what to look out for this year? I mean, if you look at the level of reserves, foreign reserves, it's declining and it's at about 488 million US dollars at the end of 2018, which is under three months of import cover. So they're within the danger zone in terms of reserves being too weak. Uh, and the Minister of Finance there says that's the pre-source curse, meaning um, they're having effects of the resource curse even before the resources are uh, fully um, um, are on uh, experience and, and, and the, the resources can be properly exploited, which is rather unfortunate. Um, let's switch to Jamaica. And you know Jamaica continues to be a success story coming out of the IMF program that they had. They continue to see growth, which is increasing. Growth average 1.8% for the first three quarters of last year. Uh, we've seen growth in mining, construction, and agriculture, um, with and ex, the, the, the economy is expected to expand by one and a half to two and a half percent last year. Um, the exchange rate uh, basically has been fluctuating in both directions, um, based on the uh, inflation targeting regime and the relaxation of some of the controls around the exchange rate movements, but. Um, inflation is expected to remain around and to rise, sorry, to about five and a half percent based partly on the, on the depreciation of the currency. One of the things we have to pay attention to in Jamaica though, uh, for this year and beyond, is the fact that crime is still taking a toll on the Jamaica economy. And whilst you can fix the macroeconomic fundamentals, if you continue to have crime and other social um, ills, uh, you, you can, you, we can see some of the economic progress being undermined. Um, but we feel that Jamaica will continue on a path of positive growth and reforms that will continue to show and to yield benefits for growth and for the, the exchange rate and inflation and so on. Um, let's switch to Suriname, where also there's been some excitement uh, in the past year or so with what's happening in their economy. Um, the central bank is printing money um, and they have some fiscal weakening, fiscal deficits that are widening. 
in Suriname, a primary fiscal deficit last year, for example, uh, the monetary base up 2.7 times, uh, 2.7 times expansion since as of November last year, since it began expanding. This is largely to, it, this is likely to put pressure on reserves and put pressure on the currency itself. Unemployment is around 8% and the inflation rate is stabilized at about 5.5% as of late last year. Um, what to watch uh, on, on Suriname, the things to expect this year. We expect that the fiscal trend will continue. Um, we expect that the, that the central bank will continue to print, um, which are not sustainable policy solutions. Um, and the fiscal deficit is wide as it is. So we don't expect that this situation in, in Suriname is going to improve meaningfully. Yes, they might have commodity price movements in their favor, but those are likely to be temporary and also it doesn't address the underlying problems and the, and the structural problems. So not a good outlook for Suriname. In terms of Trinidad and Tobago, I, in my view, all of the macroeconomic fundamentals are going in the wrong direction in Trinidad, especially now that we're within two years of the next general election. Um, fiscal policy is and has been becoming much more accommodative the fiscal target last year was not met, the deficit target, and this, this fiscal year, the, the deficit target is even wider. Um, reserves have been declining by about a billion dollars every year, each year for each 12 month period. And Trinidad has lost a, a third of the reserves that it held in December of 2014. Um, capital flight has also been taking place as demonstrated by the deficit on the capital account since 2003, which demonstrates that there is no confidence in the economy and everybody's trying to take their capital out. What to watch this year? I think S&P is going to issue a downgrade and I wouldn't be surprised if Moody's at least puts a negative outlook on their rating. Um, I think that uh, investment is going to continue to suffer and therefore growth is going to continue to suffer in Trinidad and Tobago. I don't see growth being meaningfully over zero this year, even though the government is projecting somewhere around 2% or 2.5%, I'm thinking close to zero is what is likely to happen this year. Um, shifting to the Bahamas, so we have stay over growth at 16% um, last year, year over year, and cruise growth at about 6%. Um, and tourism, as well as FDI related to tourism, continues to drive overall economic growth in Bahamas. The fiscal position can be improved, um, and part of the that's part of the reason why VAT um, was increased to 12%. Um, switching now to Belize, we see that uh, the the current account deficit is high and consistently high. Um, GDP growth is projected to be less than 2% through 2023. So it's going to have a low growth outlook for quite some time. Exports are declining and um, the central bank financing of the government, in other, in other words, printing, that both of those things can put pressure on the exchange rate and on the currency. So not necessarily not a good outlook there in Belize. In Let's switch to Bermuda. Um, unemployment fell to 6% um, in 2018, um, but there was negative growth in the first quarter of last year. GDP fell by about 0.4% year over year. Um, stayover arrivals were up 4.7% and cruise arrivals up 14%. Switching quickly now to Aruba, GDP contracted by about 0.5% in 2018. Um, businesses uh, report that sentiment is at a record low. Uh, so, and the same for consumer confidence. Uh, government spending is likely to be um, reduced, um, but tourism is expected to grow marginally at 0.9% and there are no longer um there's no longer consideration about uh the refinery 
being upgraded. That, so that's no longer in the forecast. Um, switching to Curacao, um, there's been a 1.6% contraction in the economy last year. And this has a bit to do with what's happening in Venezuela and that's affecting um, economic activity, but also refinery activity, activity in Curacao. There's 14% unemployment as well in Curacao. Switching to St. Martin, the economy contracted by 8.1% last year, which is, wow, that's a fast contraction. And of course, that has a lot to do with the lingering effects of the storm. The, sto the stopover, um, uh, sorry, stopover arrivals were down 69% and cruise passenger arrivals down 15%. And their economy is, of course, heavily based on tourism. And that's what would have affected growth. Let's switch to Haiti. Um, the currency uh, depreciation accelerated to 17.5% year over year in 2018. There are so, some socioeconomic um, instability that is affecting growth and affecting broader macroeconomic stability. Um, access to monetary support from the international community um, could reduce the financing of the government but there is a lot of uncertainty and they're highly reliant on external financing that can pose a problem. So in concluding, um, now that we've run through everything, basically in terms of the outliers, the Dominican Republic, of course, will continue to be an outlier in terms of what positive growth we can see in any country in this region. Um, and on the negative side, Puerto Rico continues to be a negative outlier. Um, so those are the two extremes. In between, you will notice that most economies are growing in the Caribbean um, with, with few exceptions. Uh, this year, some of those economies that are recovering from the storms will continue to recover and will stabilize. The countries that are likely to show, as I highlighted Barbados, um, that are going through uh, some kind of an economic adjustment can also be affected. I think Jamaica is also a success story that must be highlighted. Um, and it goes to show when you exercise fiscal prudence and you implement doing business reforms and you promote a private sector-led growth strategy, it can yield benefits for the longer term. I think Trinidad and Tobago is entering a phase of uncertainty less than two years before general election um, with regard to what's happening with Petrotrin but also broader the lack of confidence in the economy. Um, at this rate, my own view is that we're likely to see further uh, downgrades, and we're also likely to see Trinidad have to go to the IMF by 2021 or 2022 if things continue like this. Um, and of course, the authorities uh, are painting a completely different and a completely, in my view, untrue picture of the state of affairs and the state of the economy there. And that's not, that's never a good thing to do. Um, Barbados is likely to be the next story, success story in the Caribbean after Jamaica, should they continue along this path of adhering to the guidelines outlined by the IMF. And again, I have to highlight the fact that Venezuela, I think, poses the most immediate as well as the longer term, the most serious longer term risks for this region. Um, we desperately need stability in Venezuela, not just for Venezuela, but for the Caribbean region as well. I thank you for joining us and for listening. And um, we'll do this again soon. Thank you.